Welcome back to my channel, Balance Sheets Matter. Today we're going to be looking at Lumen Technologies, formerly known as CenturyLink. This was a subscriber request stock, but before we get into the stock analysis, I just want to ask that subscriber and anyone else actually interested in this stock, why are you interested in this stock? Look at the chart. This is just complete carnage. This is awful, but I'm going to go into the stock analysis and show you why this pivot started happening and how you could have at least avoided this last leg down and a lot of this because there was a lot of early warning signs with Lumen Technologies, formerly known as CenturyLink. But before we get into the stock analysis, make sure to subscribe to my channel, Balance Sheets Matter. I do stock analysis videos, so if you want to get uh, good ideas on stocks to buy or value stocks to avoid, make sure to subscribe to my channel, Balance Sheets Matter. Okay, so let's get into the stock analysis now. Let's first look at a few of the high-level metrics here. First of all, Guru Focus Band, showing it could be majorly undervalued, also saying possible value trap, think twice. I think that is very good advice this time from it. And other thing I want to look at, look at the Altman Z-score. This is a predictor of bankruptcy, especially in companies that are going to have trouble raising capital. This is an extreme distress right now, so this is not a good sign and could be basically foreshadowing a future bankruptcy of Lumen Technologies here. And as you can see, basically the revenue growth trend is not up anymore. It's been going down. EBITDA is going down. Everything's just going down. It's not going very good. But I want to top pop up a little further than a 15-year analysis. Let's get into a 20-year, and we're going to look at some of the financials. First of all, for a company like this, return return on invested capital, an average weighted average cost of capital, very important to look at. As you can see, the return on invested capital usually was at best at their weighted average cost of capital, many times below, meaning when they're investing and taking debt, they could be destroying value, which I think has been happening a lot along the way as we'll see in the financials as we go down. So this was one big warning sign that this is not a company that should be taking on debt or diluting shares to basically try to grow the company because when they do that, they're spending more money than they're actually making, which I think is something which happened with them. So basically, we look at the long-term revenue trend. They did do some acquisitions. Basically, from 2010 to 2011, they did a big acquisition. I forget, I think it was Quest or something. I would have to look at that, but you can see also they took on a lot of debt when they did that. And this is kind of was the death of the company, I would say. This is when all the problems started. Since basically the revenue peaked in 2012 at just over $18 billion and slowly started declining since then. 2017 and 2018, they did another acquisition, which was, I think, Lumen. And then CenturyLink switched its name to Lumen in 2020. But you can see even after that the revenue continues to decline. This is telling us when we're seeing this decline in revenue that there's a fundamental deterioration in the business. You do not want to get into companies that are deteriorating in revenue. When you have deteriorating revenue and also you can see the gross margin from this period too, after 2013 basically, starts going down as well. And while I've gone over both value traps and how a lot of them will, you'll just see maybe the gross margin declining, but revenue increasing. You already had the double whammy here of the gross margins going down, the revenue is going down. You know there's big problems happening. And then basically the reason why the revenue is so much down is because in the last year they sold off a big chunk of, I think it was emerging markets or other uh, section of their business. But even then the gross margin is still down, revenue is still trending down. This is just not good overall. So basically gross margin was a big warning sign. And you can see basically when I was talking 2013, 2014, when you start seeing these problems happen with the chart here and the stock starts going down, well, the reason why that's happening is the market, at least the smart money, is seeing this fundamental deterioration. They're seeing this revenue go down and they're seeing the gross margin go down at the same time. And they know that spells trouble. And then you're also seeing the exact same with the thing with the operating margin. Basically after this acquisition, operating margin starts getting going down, it starts getting lower and lower and not looking good and interest expense is going up and up and up and where it's this not at a good point right now. It's kind of at that point where, because you're declining revenue, declining like, uh, you know, gross margin as well, this may be unrecoverable because right now, basically the last 12 months since they've sold off like a portion of the business there, there's 2.1 billion and basically operating income and 1.2 billion interest expense, which is a really bad ratio. But let's just look at the last quarter here. And again, it's completely terrible. Basically, you had 467 million and 385 million, and their net interest expense there is close to $300 million. Almost all the money they're making on operating income is just going to pay off interest. That's 
a terrible spot to be in for a company. And basically it's other operating expense here. This is them writing off goodwill from obviously bad acquisitions since they have to write it down to the fair value, which for a lot of it is probably nothing right now, which is why they're writing off so much. And you can see net income back here. It was like, okay, they started making some big losses. Again, a lot of this is not real cash going out, but it's just writing off these bad acquisitions. Still not good because of you know, it has destroyed shareholder value and the shares outstanding has been going up too. So even in these early days, there really wasn't anything good when they're doing these other acquisitions and they're trying to grow their, they bought back a little shares like here and there or whatever, but they're just doing these huge share issuances, diluting the shareholder while the revenue is going down, while the gross margins going down. So even these years in, uh, and like before from 2014 to 2018, there was a lot of problems you could see that were going on in the company that would tell you to stay away. And this is what the stock chart was telling you too. There wasn't anything going good. It starts declining. It just keeps going down and it's going to go down a lot more, possibly go bankrupt. It you know, seems pretty probable at this point as we'll continue on. So what are they sitting at right now in their current assets on their balance sheet? $4.8 billion, almost 4.9. Current liabilities, just under $4 billion. Well, it doesn't look like they're going to go bankrupt in this year, according to the current ratio. Although, you know, still could happen. Usually Altman Z score, which I was referring to earlier, that's usually about a two year predictor or so. And then we have total assets of $36 billion. But look at this, basically almost $10 billion of that is intangible assets. And intangible assets basically can be good when your company's growing as you can kind of use them as a, in a way collateral, like, you know, showing on your balance sheet, you have equity there to take on debt. But when the company is declining like this, and you can see the intangible assets have been going down along with the goodwill, they may already be worthless. There may actually not be any value here. So I would not add in this, any of these intangible assets because it looks about 6 billion of that is some type of intangibles they have. 3.8 billion is goodwill. At this point with the, where the company is, I will consider that all worthless. So I would say their total assets are really more sitting around $26 billion. And even that's gonna be questionable too, depending how they've been depreciating everything. And then we basically see, you know, total current liabilities, $33 billion. So I think in the real world here, they have quite a bit of negative equity, says to solar stockholder equity of 2.2 billion here. Again, I'm taking out all the intangibles. So it's closer to something where negative seven to eight billion, in my opinion, at least. So look at look at the cash flow opinion, uh, statement here. Basically, let's look at cash flow from depreciation. From at least 2011, it's relatively been pretty stable, going down a little bit. Purchase of plant property and equipment, they've been doing a little bit under what the replacement cost is. So that does speak to that there's like not as excess ec real equity on their balance sheet because if that were happening, or at least for the real tangible assets, basically, they would be purchasing a lot more than they were depreciating here. They're actually depreciating more. So there may be a little bit of actual value on the assets in the balance sheet, but remember it's already at 10, negative 10 billion or negative 8 billion, as I was saying before. So even if there is a little bit extra there, it's probably not gonna be enough to make up for that negative equity. So it's pretty relevant anyways. You can see the acquisition here, sale of the business there. Uh, it's not really that important anymore as so we already went over it and you know repurchase of stock i don't know why in 2021 they would repurchase any stock you see they did some little spotty repurchases before there's some issuance of stock before issuances of debt payments of debt net issuance of debt typically is negative here so they're typically just issue or they're well no they're paying off more some more debt but they're trying to at least they were getting down that debt a little bit after their big acquisitions, which is good. But the one the good thing I'll say is for all the problems they've had, at least they were paying out a dividend. And this is why I prefer more companies actually pay out a dividend because when then when things do go wrong, at least they haven't wasted all this money repurchasing stock, buying back shares up here. At least they're actually going and putting that cash in your hands. So if your investment does fail, you did actually get a good chunk of your initial investment back through the dividend. So. At least they were doing that. That's like the one good thing I can say they were doing the whole time since companies like Bed Bath & Beyond, they went the opposite route, repurchased all the stock and basically any investors in that lost it all versus if they actually had paid out dividends, it would have been a lot of that capital return to shareholders. And you can see now that basically their free cash flow is going negative. So let's look at the interactive chart here to basically get some, see what the estimates are and some other things and you can see revenue with estimate right now again the, the revenue is continuing to decline which says this this business model is in decline and 
it's it's going to be a real tough challenge to basically turn this around, stabilize a core good business, and prevent bankruptcy, especially with the amount of debt they actually have. The one thing I forgot to say is I think they have around $20 billion of long-term debt with a $1.2 billion interest expense, which is about a 6% rate, which probably if they need any more than the future is probably going to be at a higher rate because of all those issues. And 6% is higher than most of like other peers and good quality companies they'll sometimes be getting debt usually in the two to three percent range so it's already kind of they're certainly in that chunk bond level of debt already and let's look at the eps with estimate here so with the eps analysts seem to be pretty generous with this they seem to be actually assuming in the next couple years basically at least for 2024 at least not this current year but next year the year after they're going to be making somewhere around, you know, 26 cents a share. That may be kind of generous. The stock is not speaking to that. But even if that were true with a company with declining revenue and all these other problems, a stock like this really wouldn't deserve more than a 5-6 PE ratio. So even in these generous type of estimates a couple of years in the future, it's still really saying that the stock may only would be worth what it is. And that's the thing. If the stock's coming down and down and down and you actually are interested in it for some reason, you're probably gonna see a large accumulation here. You're gonna see it actually get undervalued, things stabilize, and then potentially buy. Like right now, it's just, I'm saying, well, if they do make that 26 cents in the future, two years in the future, well, this is the value they could be right now. But with all these risks, there's no point of holding something right now with this much risk that could be worth the current price it is two years in the future, if you understand what I'm saying there. So let's look at some of these other ratios. Let's look at the gross margin because I want to pop up all of these and kind of show you this fundamental slow decline that's happening. As you can see, look at this gross margin trending down the whole time. Very bad. Let's look at operating margin. Operating margin. There we go. Operating margin. Same thing. It was going down. Got a little bit of a rebound here, but I think that's just from the pivot from when they their acquisitions and how things change like that net margin because this is basically what the bottom line is and you can see this like for the last basically 20 years it's been in this slow decline so even before this 2013 2014 period you're already seeing that a lot of it again was from this acquisition here it was a really bad acquisition sometimes it's basically the death of companies there and then let's also pop up the EBITDA because the EBITDA is useful. EBITDA, there we go. We pop it up. And again, you can see, even looking at the EBITDA, ignoring the interest, there is basically almost peak profits back there. I just want to get rid of this here, get rid of the net margin. There's your profits peaked in 2013 here for the EBITDA and it's been going basically down since. So basically since 2014, when they did this acquisition here, or it was in 2011, and then it really started showing because the revenue was declining and they can't mask it anymore. You really saw all the problems really just start the all go forward at once. And that was kind of the big warning sign. So like, I, I just would completely stay away like a stock like this. I don't see the like even purchase purpose of looking at it. Frankly, if I didn't actually have someone request it, I wouldn't even look at a stock like this. I would just stay away, assume it's probably gonna go bankrupt. If it doesn't, you know, probably what you're gonna see is you're gonna see this base for a while before recovering. And even at that, it's never getting back up to here. There's some serious, basically fundamental changes the business is gonna to have to do to stop that long-term revenue decline. They're gonna to need to basically get that fixed because you can't have your revenue declining, your gross margin going down, you can't have all of that going at once. They need to stabilize, at least get that revenue flat, maybe a little bit up with inflation. That would be ideal. But until you see that, I wouldn't touch the stocks. But you know, that's just my opinion. I hope you like the stock analysis. If you did, make sure to subscribe to my channel, like the video, and I'll see you in the next stock analysis video.